Hello, everybody. This is David Scott Peters coming to you live from Phoenix, Arizona, at the world headquarters, of therestaurantexpert.com. You're here in the you're in the right place if you've heard the YouTube live event, "How to Make Your Management Style Work for You." Now we're going to get started in just a second, but I want to go through a couple housekeeping things first. I've got quite a few screens going. Uh, <laughs> it's actually kind of t tormenting me right now, but I'm ready for you, man. I've got four screens working with all information to make sure this is a great live event for you. But to get the most out of it, you've got to do a couple things for me. Number one, you need to, if you want to participate in the chat function in this YouTube live event, you need to log in to YouTube. So if you've already logged into the event, no big deal. Make sure you use your Gmail account, whatever you're logged in for, your login is for YouTube or Google, I should say. Log in so that you can take part in the chat function. I also want to make sure that you know when these events are coming up. I try and do them on a monthly basis. Sometimes my travel schedule doesn't allow me to do so, and I might miss a month here or there. But if you want to be up to date on it, not only do you want to be on my email list, but all you need to do is subscribe now to my YouTube channel, and every time one of these comes up, you're going to be aware of it as well as be notified for my weekly video tips to help you and your business uh, and other special reports, things like that. So do me a favor, do two things for me. Number one, log into your YouTube account or Google account. That way you can participate in the chat function. The second, take a moment and subscribe now to my YouTube channel so you can be notified on events like this and my weekly management tips. We're going to get started here in just a second, but one of the things I'd like to do is let you know that I've got a couple of my friends, a couple of my coworkers, working with you right now. Uh, on the chat, you're going to see Greg Sauerbach, our solutions coach, and Jenny, Jenny Brooks, our communications director, if you will. They're going to be looking at the chat window, because right now, out of the four screens I have, I don't have the live chat going. So they're going to be monitoring that for me and giving it to me here on my phone via another chat uh, window so that I know what's going on. In the meantime, do me a favor. As we allow people to log in to our live event, do me a favor and in the chat window, tell me who you are, name of your restaurant, and where you're from. Uh, I noticed for over the last few webinars I've done, we've been international. We've had people all over the globe. But I'd love to know, again, your name, your restaurant name and where you're located. If you're in Virginia or if you're in uh, Boston, whatever it may be, love to see where you are because it kind of helps me know where our reach is and get to know you a little bit better. If I've got some members on the, on the line, do me a favor, say hi, let, uh, let Greg know you're here and uh, I'm sure he'll give you a shout out. But in the meantime, log in, let me know who you are, where you're from, and we're gonna get started here in about two seconds. Again, one thing I do want to let you know is during this webinar, during this live event, I'm going to not only teach how to make your management style work for you, but at the end, I'll be answering your questions. So any questions you have, put them in that chat window. Again, you've got to be logged into your Google account, your YouTube account, so you can use that chat window. Then either Greg or Jenny, if they're easy questions, they may answer them for you. Otherwise, they're going to collect them, and I'm going to uh, get to be able to answer them right at the end of this webinar. So let's get started here, shall we? Again, I want to work, welcome everybody to here today to my YouTube live event. Our event is how to make your management style work for you, how systems help you lead. And this is very, very important. I don't care whether you own a restaurant or not, whether you're a general manager, but especially those who are restaurant owners, just because you own a restaurant doesn't make you a born leader. And it takes leadership to be successful in our business. It's extremely important for you to be working on your business, not in it. For you to be working on budgets, marketing, leading the team, coaching your team, growing the company, not flipping a burger. Well, how do we get to that point? How do we all become leaders? Because we're not all born leaders. In fact, the vast majority of us are not born leaders. This is where systems come into place. And that's what today's about. How do we duplicate ourselves? without giving up control of our checkbook, making sure things are done our way. How is it that the chain restaurants have managers in them and no owners? Heck, my son works for a Taco Bell, part of Yum! Brands, and they have 14,000 restaurants. How is it that he's able to go to work on a daily basis? And heck, man, they've got managers there, no owners. Yet we as independent operators feel like prisoners to our business. If you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. Everyone's an idiot. If all this sounds familiar to you, let alone not making the money you deserve, we can change that, and that's what today is about. Let's change that for you. Now, 
Some of you may not be familiar who I am, so let me share with you my background. My name is David Scott Peters. I grew up in my family's restaurant and catering business back in Linwood, New Jersey, where I worked for the toughest manager I know. Anybody here on this call ever worked for your mom? Right? I, I hated it, man, as a teenager. Why? Because my mom worked my sister and I twice as hard as anybody else. She said there would be no favoritism. Now, while I hated that, I really did, right? I'm a teenager, man. You got your mom at home, you got your mom at work, and she's riding me twice as hard. She did me a favor. While I hated it as a teenager, every job I had after, I elevated. My career went like that because I had a work ethic like nobody else around me. So, you know, she did me a favor. I will tell you this, payback's a bitch. She works for me now. But with that said, uh, did me a great favor. Now, Again, working for her was a great, great, great stepping stone. My career took off. At one point in time, I started working for a company called Coyote Springs Brewing Company Cafe here in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, our first location, this is early 90s when brew pubs were opening one a week. We're seeing that resurgence in brew pubs right now, but back then it was the first real flood of brew pubs. Our first location was a cash cow, man. It was hand over fist money. It was unbelievable. Our second location was much like owning a boat. Anybody on this uh, webinar <laughs> own a boat? Well, then you understand what I'm saying. It's a hole in water in which you throw money. As one made money, the other one sucked it dry. And that was horrible. But this is where I learned what I created, my smart systems. These are restaurant systems that are simple, measurable, applicable, repeatable, trainable. Systems have to be simple or you can't get anybody to use them. They must be trainable or how the hell do you get somebody to use them, right? Because as things went wrong, I had to think outside the box. Now, at some point in time, it was time for me to move on. I went to work for a company called Famous Sam's, a 30-unit restaurant sports bar chain in Arizona as a franchisor. I went as the director of operations. We were opening eight stores. I hired a a, 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 an operations team. We are going gangbusters. It was unbelievable. In under a year, the guys who bought the company wanted to take it public damn near bankrupted the company. And as upper management started taking off, I said, you know, it's, it's not the place for me to be. So I went and taught at Scottsdale Culinary Institute, Management, Human Resources, Wines, and Spirits. So do know I'm not a chef. I'm not a culinary trained professional. I'm a restaurant guy. Now, I have zero knife skills. I'm horrible in the kitchen. Don't get me wrong. With the right systems in place, I can run any of your kitchens. I can order based on budget. I can schedule based on budget. I can schedule based off staffing guides, open and close every single station based on checklists. I can order based on par levels. Look, man, I can run a kitchen. What I can't do is teach knife skills. I cannot teach how to cook certain dishes. So it's very important we talk about systems to put yourself in a position that you know your information. It's your system, your process, your way. Now, as I was teaching at Scottsdale Culinary Institute, I was a consulting for the minority shareholders at Famous Sam's. And they kept asking me to come back and take over the company and turn it around. And I kept saying, no, no, no. And it was about one month before my first child was born. I said, okay. And I walked into a disaster. This company should have been bankrupt, done, toast. Yet I was given the goal to turn the company around in five years and sell it. You know what? I missed that goal. I missed that goal by three months. I know what it is to be an independent operator. I know what makes the chain successful. It's my job in life to give you the same system tools that chains use without losing our independence, without you know, going against us not loving our guests, not loving our employees. Hell, we're still gonna love them, but we are gonna do what the chains do well, and that's what? It's make money, right? I mean, did anybody start their restaurant to be a charity? It happens. They're called churches. I have a few of those in our system, but otherwise we're here to make money. So we've got to keep that in mind, but how do we do that? And that's a part of what today is about. Not necessarily the money part, but how we can lead the business, use the tools to make money, but more importantly, have others help. That's very, very important. I've been working with independent restaurants now for 14 years from coaching, seminars, workshops, training materials, our online software, you name it. I know what it is to be an independent operator. It is my job to give you the same systems and tools to change use without losing your independence. We love our guests. We love our employees, but we are going to do what they do well, and that's make money. So what is today about? What are we going to be focusing on? Well, we're going to be focusing on your management style, who you are, something I call the restaurant owner matrix. If you're a manager, it'll apply. We're talking about how you use systems to complement your personality. 
how to get the most out of your team and make money, how to effectively communicate, but more importantly, how do we change your behaviors to make sure you can be more effective in your business? Now, I'm gonna, this is one of the few times I'm actually gonna read from a slide, but in a moment I'm gonna do so. What you're gonna see on your screen right now, this is what I call my restaurant owner matrix. I, I put this together years ago because I really was trying to get out of writing an article. I've been writing a newsletter article for my newsletter for 14 years, or 13 out of the 14 years, and sometimes I just go nuts. It's one of the things I hate to do. Not that I'm not good at it. It's like taking inventory for many of you. If without a deadline, it wouldn't happen. I can get on stage all day long and talk for hours and hours and hours, but to sit in front of a blank screen and start typing, phew, it drives me nuts. Well, it's something I have to do. But at one point in time, I was doing something else. I was on an airplane, going on a consult, somebody else reading a book, saw a matrix in the book. I'm like, I got to have a matrix. Switch my brain off and switch from article to something I wanted to do. And what the restaurant owner matrix is, it's I know who you are within minutes of meeting you. I literally know who you are within minutes. You're either a crazy maker, a motion an emotion-driven decision maker, or you are a pencil pusher, a numbers-driven decision maker. Most of us on this call are social workers, people-driven decision makers, but where I need each and every one of us, I need you to be a head coach, a systems-driven decision maker who leads people. Now, let's, let's look at this, this graph. The more I go up, the more I depend on my numbers and my systems, budgets and so on. The more I come across the bottom, the more I like to be the center of attention. I love Restaurant 101, taking care of my guests, keeping, making people happy, creating experiences and memories. So the more I go up access, the up the access, that is about numbers and systems that will go across more about Restaurant 101, hospitality. Well, you'll notice the more I depend on my numbers, the more I become a pencil pusher, somebody who really looks at the numbers. If the more I go across and I care about the guest experience, the more I become a social worker. Well, where do I need you to be a head coach? Now do know, no matter where you are, I can teach you to be a head coach. That's where systems come, in, come involved. This is how you lead people. But when times of stress, you are who you are. So like if I'm, I'm a, a pencil pusher and I love numbers and I'm impatient with people from time to time and, and I'm a chef, when the bill collector's calling, guess where I'm hiding? In the kitchen, rocking that chef knife. Oh, I'm happy. No, I'm busy. I'm in the kitchen, right? We go to our happy place, man. You are who you are, but through learned behaviors and the use of systems, I can make each and every one of us a leader. So what do we start with? We start with a pencil pusher. And again, excuse me, I'm going to read this for you. A pencil, uh, I'm sorry, a crazy maker. A crazy maker makes decisions based out of necessity and fear. This individual is often a passive manager, allowing his or her employees to dictate the way things will be done. In extreme cases, they put themselves in the role of victim whose restaurant is out of control. I hope nobody on this webinar right now, this live event, is a crazy maker. It, you're usually a victim in your business. Now, I am going to show you, somebody may be. We literally have almost 200 people on this webinar right now. Okay, I mean, this is big. There's so many, so there's bound to be a crazy maker on here. Well, I feel sorry for you because you've got the toughest road to hoe. You're often the person who's a victim in your business. Now, I have positive and negative char characteristics for each one of these. You may be some, not all. So positive characteristics can be risk taker, entrepreneurial, and generous. Negative characteristics can be runs a business based off their bank account, pays bills based on who screams the loudest, buries a head in the sand, avoids conflict, wonders why they ever got in the business, thinks their staff are stupid, suffers from something called common sense-itis. I got news for you. There's no such thing as common sense. Often feels their customers owe them, will hire a chain manager just to fix everything, tries to do everything themselves, and often works a line position to save money. I hope nobody on this webinar is that person. Now, many of you, many of us are pencil pushers. Who is a pencil pusher? A pencil pusher makes decisions based primarily on the numbers and the tasks that need to be accomplished. In most cases, this individual is an implementer, someone who gets systems in place in every aspect of their business. In extreme cases, they can be distrusting micromanagers who don't clearly communicate what they want done so they feel like they can't let go. Pencil pushers are usually those numbers people hide in the office, run their business off their security cams on their freaking cell phones, right? They're impatient. 
Numbers, numbers, numbers. Are you stupid? I told you how to do it. Now, it's an extreme, but that tends to be who they are. Now, positive characteristics can be understands their business numbers, tracks to uh, make changes and get results, well-organized, checklist-oriented, energetic. Negative characteristics can be hides in the office, poor communication skills, does not like the limelight, uncomfortable managing people, has high turnover in all positions. Well, there's a lot of us on this call right now, on this webinar, that are a pencil pusher. You love the numbers, you think you're a little bit impatient. Well, the vast majority of us on this call are social workers. Why? We're in the hospitality business. We are built to take care of people. A social worker makes decisions based on the needs and feelings of their customers and employees before their own needs. This individual is most likely a visionary and has strong communication skills. They also strive to be well-liked in their business and community and often fill a figurative mayor role for both. In extreme cases, they are more concerned about their image rather than the profitability or success of the restaurant. Now, many, 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 many of us in this business, whether an owner or manager, we are social workers. We often let Jose work overtime because we don't want him to work at another restaurant. We give Sally extra hours because she's pregnant and we want her to be successful as a mother. And all of a sudden we, we give our guests larger portions and we add lots of staff to the floor because we want to give great, great hospitality. And we bleed ourselves dry because we don't pay attention to the numbers. We just care about the guest experience. Don't get me wrong, guest experience is extremely important. Now, here's some positive characteristics. Great communicator, understands the importance of training, delivers wow customer service. Negative characteristics can be run their business like a charity, put their staff needs above all else, all about ideas, not about action, allows employee pushback to dictate decisions, ignores numbers, juggles bills to stay afloat, works too many hours, and often works a line position to save money. Now, no matter where you are on this spectrum, whether, whether you're one of any of these, I need to make you a head coach. What is a head coach? A head coach makes decisions based on the systems and leads their team with strong communication skills. Like a great general manager, this individual understands that it's not only important to implement the systems, but it, that it's imperative that you follow up on the systems and make sure they're being used. They, they also make it a point to train people that are not afraid and are not afraid to discipline them when necessary. In extreme cases, they get too comfortable and trust that people know what to do, then take their eye off the ball. In these cases, systems fall by the wayside. But notice, these are people who lead. They use systems to lead. Here are positive characteristics can be. Again, you're not all positive, you're not all negative. Entrepreneurial, confident, leader, fair, great communicator, calculated risk taker, problem solver, understands their numbers, tracks to make changes, get results, well organized, gives management the authority to do their job, not just the responsibility. You have to give them the ability to do their job, make decisions. Understands the importance of training, delivers wow customer service. Negative characteristics can be, has a tendency to too much things, or trust things are getting done replaces people too quickly, impatient, thrives on change, right, just for the sake of change, gets bored easily, may create unrealistic, unrealistic expectations for the team. Now, I don't care where you fall on the spectrum. For instance, if you're a pencil pusher and you're off the charts, guess what systems force you to do? Communicate how you want service, how clean you want the restaurant, what you want done. It forces you to communicate, making you a head coach. I don't care if you're a social worker and you're giving away the shop. Guess what? We now add budgets and numbers we need to pay attention to. Systems in place to achieve those numbers. Coaching to achieve those numbers. Next thing you know, I'm a head coach. See, I don't care where you fall in head coach. If you just barely make it any spectrum, the fact is as soon as we move that needle, that dot, if you will, who you are as a person into the head coach position, using systems to make up for our leadership weaknesses, we are now systems-driven decision makers who lead people. That's what systems are about. Look, man, I understand it's difficult to change. I'm not going to change who you are as a person overnight. It's not going to happen. But I can teach you skill sets teach you habits by using systems to make up for your weaknesses. Also to hold people accountable, get more done, make money. This is what today is about. 
how do I take my personality traits, whether I'm a crazy maker, pencil pusher, social worker, head coach, or hopefully the like, I'm going to make you a head coach. How am I successful using those systems? Before I go further in this, it is important that all the systems I talk about, that you understand that it all revolves around something called prime cost. And that starts with understanding one of the key systems to being a leader in your business is a budget. I tell people when I talk to them at any given time, the two most important systems any restaurant should have to have any chance of making money are budgets and recipe costs and cards. By the way, what do you think the two systems the most independents never have? Because they're too hard, David. Boo frickin' who, right? Get out of the gosh darn restaurant business. It's tough, man. But if you want to be successful, budgets are critical. Why? Why? Because budgets, they tell us what we need to do to be successful. You take your last 12 months, that's what we do with our members. We take your last 12 months P&L, we say, what do you think your sales are going to be? And based on your variable or fixed expenses, plug in the fixed expenses, the variable expenses as percentage, and say, if you operate the next 12 months based on your forecasted sales, the same way you operated the last 12 months, what are you going to make? And I want you to get to the end of that 12 months and go, ew, I deserve more. Now we decide what systems to put in place to achieve new numbers. For instance, hey man, I'm going to implement the key item port waste sheet, two clipboard systems, and the purchase allotment system to get my team ordering on budget. I'm going to teach them how to put that system in place in the first month, hold them accountable month two. By the second slash third month, I'm going to lower my food cost two to three points because I know for a fact that by implementing those two clipboard systems and that budgeting system, any restaurant and every restaurant should see a minimum of a two, three point drop in food cost. Why? Because we're paying attention to our numbers. And so all of a sudden we can say we're going to work on our recipe cards and by month five, we're going to do a menu analysis. By month six, we will have re-engineered a menu, gotten it on the table that reduces our food cost by five points because that's what we need to do. Budgets are huge. We create a plan for success instead of being lucky or not. I made money or I didn't. You have the power to control that. Yes, things change. That's why budgets are measured. That's what we measure and improves. We take our P&L, put it against our budget. We see where you hit or missed. If I missed my numbers, what systems do my managers not paying attention to that I need to implement? Get back into place. Or what if they're using the systems? What new systems do I need to put in place to achieve numbers that I need to make? And oh, by the way, if I lost $3,000 in profitability last month, I don't go, oh, oh shit, I lost $3,000. No, I look at the rest of my budget the next 11 months and decide what small changes I'm going to make in order to make up that three grand. I'm going to make the money I deserve without giving up guest satisfaction, cutting product quality or service. I will never tell you to go against your core values and who you are as a restaurant and a person. But I'm telling you right now, there's so much money on the table that we just blow because we don't pay attention, because we don't have systems, because we're either pencil pushers or we're social workers. I need you to be a head coach. Do know that when I talk about prime costs, when I go next section, I don't care about industry standards. I don't care if the National Restaurant Association says the average full service restaurant has a food cost of 34% because who the hell said that was your freaking number? What if your restaurant should be producing a 22% food cost and you hit 34? You're losing thousands upon thousands of dollars every single month, but you're patting yourself on your back. Hey, I'm doing a great job. What if you were a steakhouse supposed to run a 38% food cost and the only way your chef can keep his or her job is, is cheapen up the product, reduce portion sizes, screw the guest? Because based on your recipe cards and your mix, your food cost is higher and they want to keep their job. See, you've got to have systems in place to know where your numbers should be. But a budget, that's important because why? It matters based on your restaurant, your style of service, your product quality, your price points, your core values, where we get to that prime cost. Now, what goes into prime cost? Well, a couple things. Total cost of goods sold plus total labor cost. Now, let me be very, very clear. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm going to go pretty quick. If you want to learn more about prime cost, look on my YouTube channel. I go into this in great depth. But with that said, it's your total cost of goods sold plus your total labor cost. Cost of goods sold, by the way, is not purchases divided by sales. If you take all of your purchases last month, divide them by your sales, and you think that's your food cost, you're dead ass wrong. 
because it has inventories. You could have ordered very little, but used a lot of product off your shelves, food cost is higher. Vice versa, you could, you could have ordered a ton, but you have a ton on the shelves, which means your food cost is actually lower than it should be. So it requires inventory. Now, if you don't take inventories, and I go out there, and I'm gonna tell you right now, unless you've been working with me for a while, you don't take inventories. Independent restaurants don't take inventories. Why? They're so hard. Boo frickin' who? When you walk around your restaurant, what do you see on your shelves? Not food, not booze, money. And you wonder why you're not making money as it's tied up on the shelves at risk to be stolen, wasted, spoiled. And the last time I, I checked, I don't pay my bills with profits, I pay them with cash. And the last time I checked as well, I can't go to the power company with a case of stakes and say, thud, we're even. So cash is king. I need inventories to see where that cash is, how much I have on the shelves. But ultimately, if you don't take inventories because in cost of goods sold is beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending because we use, use divided by sales, done. If you don't take inventories, I got something for you. Take your last 12 months purchases divided by your last 12 months sales. That is your food cost. Because in a year's time, that fluctuation in inventory, that's really small. And so it's not going to affect your cost of goods sold that much. So we know our total cost of goods sold, then we have labor. That includes what I call the raw labor cost. That's when somebody clocks in at the register. Let's say I have a cook. I'm still in a, in a state that doesn't have $15 minimum wage. It's coming. $10 an hour. I punch in, punch out one hour as a cook. Owners, in the chat window right now, does $10 come out of your bank account? That's all I worked for the week. $10. Is that what comes out of your bank account? Enter it in the chat window. What's the answer? No. $12, $13 comes out of your bank account. There's taxes, benefits, insurance. Oh, they're a part of prime cost too. Manager salaries, they're a part of prime cost. What about you, the owner? Are you part of prime cost? The answer is yes or no depending on what situation you're in. If I'm a small restaurant, I'm doing $500,000 a year in sales and I'm the general manager, guess what? I'm a part of prime cost because I show up five days a week, minimum, keys in hand, and I'm supposed to run the shift. Now, or an adjusted salary. Let's say I pay myself 60 grand, but for my $500,000 restaurant, I'd pay my general manager 35 grand. Well, $35,000 of your salary is a part of prime cost. Why? I eventually want to fire you. I want to replace you with a manager. If I work two shifts a week on the floor as a manager, then two-fifths or an adjusted two-fifths of my salary is part of prime cost. Why? Because I'm going to replace you with somebody else. I want to fire every owner on this webinar on this YouTube live event. I want you working on your business, not in it. I don't care if you show up seven days a week because you love your tables and your chairs and you hug them and go, oh, I love you. I don't care, but I want the business to run even if you walk out the door your way. That's what systems provide us. So total cost goods sold plus total labor costs, including taxes, benefits, insurance. By the way, you got a marketing person, an accounting person, not a part of prime cost. It's whoever it takes to run the business, the restaurant side of things. Now, do I measure it off of gross or net sales? Let's define them first because most of your POS systems define gross and net sales incorrectly. Gross sales is the ring at the register before discounts, not including sales tax. Sales tax is the government allowing us to collect their money as an accounts payable and penalizing us like they're the mob, right? The, the interest is unbelievable. Don't mess with the government's money. Ring of the register before discounts, not including sales tax. If I ring up a $10 burger, comp $5, gross sales is $10. Net sales, ring of the register after discounts, not including sales tax. Ring up a $10 burger, comp $5, well, $5 is net sales. Let me ask you a question. Do I measure total cost of goods sold plus total labor cost against gross or net sales? Type it in the chat window. I'm really curious to see because I've seen the trend change on this answer. Well, the short answer is this, gross sales. Now, also, by the way, gross sales column on most POS systems, eight out of 10 probably, is net sales. It's minus the discounts. Now, why do I say that? Well, how do I measure my chef, my kitchen manager properly on food costs when I'm going to show you what ideal food cost looks like in a moment? Following recipe cards and menu mix. Is it, if I've got a, a burger for $10, I'm going to use $3 in product, use divided by sales is 30% food cost. 
Well, if I discount $5, do I have half the cost of goods sold? No, I still have $3. Use divided by sales takes a 30% food cost, makes it 60. Is that chef's fault that you ran a discount? No. So I need to make sure I measure my management team off of gross sales. Still not with me? Let's say, all right, my social working friends, you you'll run a charity event tomorrow, close your restaurant, $14,000 event, and you're going to comp 50%. Makes your heart sing. Right? 50% comp seven grand. Do you staff for a $7,000 day or $14,000 day? $14,000. Do you buy food and booze? For a $14,000 day or a $7,000 day? $14,000. Do I measure gross or net? Gross. Don't get me wrong. Comps are a line item on your P&L and it's money you don't get. It does affect your profitability, but it's not. I staff for my gross sales, not my net. Very, very important. Now, when I started this business 14 years ago, most people would answer net. We're getting better. Most, I'm getting more and more people say gross sales. But I also tell you the numbers used to be different. The industry standard, the benchmark, was 65% full service, 60% quick service. That means for every dollar it comes in sales, I use 65 cents in people and product to deliver that product. Then I thought I was a hero. I pat myself on my back. I had my people, my members down to 60% prime cost. But then we have all of our costs going through the roof. Food costs haven't been going down at all since, since 2011. They just keep going up. Labor costs, we're seeing $15 minimum wage on either one of our coasts, and it's coming. We're, we need EPLI insurance. We've got marketing expenses. We've got software expenses. We've got all these things that chew for my bottom line, and I'm telling you these numbers don't work anymore. I'm here to tell you if you do at least $850,000 a year and more in sales, your new prime cost target is 55% or under. Let me be very, very clear, 55% or under. That means if you're a million dollar a year in gross sales restaurant right now, patting yourself on the back because you run 65%, I'm telling you there's 10 points on the table or $100,000 in bottom line profitability on the same damn sales you're doing right now. Do you want that money? Like, do me a favor. Everybody who's logged into the chat function, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to quickly type in a, a yes or no answer. If I could hand you a duffel bag right now with $100,000 $100,000 said it's yours, but you've got a lot of hard work to do in your business. No get rich, no sales scheme, no nothing. Same sales you're doing today, you could make $100,000 more. In fact, I've gotten this duffel bag right now. I'm going to give it to you, but you've got to do hard work. How many of you right now, answer yes or no, are willing to do the work to make that $100,000? I'm waiting. Most of you are typing in the word yes, you lie. You love the idea of work, but man, when it comes to getting people to do it, oh, David, I tried, I tried. I don't know what the hell that means, I tried. Trying gets you nothing. You either do or you don't do. And that's what you've got to determine. Are you going to allow two, three employees to hold you back further and say, this is too hard, oh, I don't have time, whatever, bullshit. You've got a business to lead, and if people don't want to come along on the journey, you have to be big enough to let them go. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to coach them. I'm going to train them. I need them to be a part of this journey, but they get to make a choice. No longer do you want one, two, three people to hold you back. Does that make sense? So you've got to be ready to do this work. Now, let's get into where prime cost is. I don't care how we get there. You could run a family restaurant, 30% uh, cost goods sold, 25% labor cost, that's 55. You could run a burger restaurant, 20% cost goods sold, 35% labor cost, that's 55. I could be a steakhouse, 40% food cost. But since the ring of the register is high and the cash contribution is high, it lowers my labor cost, right? It doesn't take two cooks to flip a steak that's double the profitability of a burger. So this works. That's why prime cost is very much based on a number, but the mix is based on you, your business, style of service, and so on. So I don't care how we get there. You got 55, 55 points. Those of you on this webinar right now think 55% is not possible. Get the hell off my webinar because you're right. If you think it's not possible in your business, you're right. Now look, if you do under $850,000 a year in, in sales, your number is 60% prime cost. But if you don't think these numbers are possible, you're right. Get off. I got nothing for you, man. 
But I got hundreds of restaurants in my system right now, and I could literally have people running in the 40% prime cost, 30, high 30% poor cost, uh, or, or, I'm sorry, prime cost. They're getting huge change without giving up gas satisfaction, without cutting product quality or service because they're finally paying attention to their business. Do you want those kinds of results? Then you need to lead your damn people. You need to lead your restaurant with systems, and that's what we're going to talk about right now. Now I'm going to make a switch here on my screen. Now hopefully you can see me and two additional screens, the PowerPoint screen as well as I've got in my larger window, I've got what we call Smart Systems Pro, our online restaurant management solution handles every aspect of your business. I'm just going to use as an example to show you, I'm not going to teach anything in the system, I'm just going to show you when I refer to a system, what it looks like and what the value is. So let's first go back to the PowerPoint and say food and beverage systems. We know what prime cost is, we know we need a budget, we know we need to lead with systems, communicate what we want, how do we get there, what are these systems, right? Well, let's look at this. Number one, let's talk about recipe costing cards. Well, why recipe cost cards? Why are those so damn important? Let me do a favor here, I'm going to make this larger on the screen for y'all, font wise. I'm going to go to my recipe costing cards and I'm going to go into something called my All American Burger. This is an item recipe, something that I sell. Here's number one. If you don't know what every item you sell costs you, don't give me I generally know what the protein costs, right? I generally know what the side dish costs. Are we an industry of pennies or dollars? Pennies. If you generally know what something costs, then you generally aren't making money. If you don't know what every item on your recipe, on your menu costs you, then you are throwing your profitability, what I call dumbass luck. Really? Do you think every retail store kind of looks at an item and go, what should we charge? I don't know. Picks it out of their ass? No, that's what we do in the restaurant business, and it's wrong. But I will show you, we can have items that have a higher cost of goods sold and lower cost of goods sold because we sell more of the, the lower cost. We can drive our food costs down. We don't have to jack up prices and things like that. But here, recipe cards. What is the benefit? Not only do I have this all-American burger and I've got all the ingredients, well, the ingredients and the quantity tells me consistency. I can train my cooks on how many ounces or how many eaches, a leaf of lettuce, two slices of bacon, whatever it is goes on this. I can have build charts down at the bottom here, build charts, mise en place, prep instructions. I can have pictures so I know what it's supposed to look like. I can come in and I can add product knowledge that we use Chuck Round how, and how we cook. So by the time I'm finished, I have books. I have a recipe costing card book. I've got a recipe book how I cook. I've got training instructions. But this allows me to know what the costs are, whether I can make money. It allows me to have standard recipes and train those standards. It gives me the ability to later in a moment talk about menu engineering and no ideal food cost, but before I get out of recipe cards, I actually want to go in here and I want to go to a batch recipe. What is a batch recipe? It's an ingredient, a side dish, a dessert, a soup, something you make from scratch. And I'm going to go to my caramelized onion relish. Why are batch recipes so important? Because we produce our own products like any other manufacturer and we need to know the cost. So when I come down here, I look at it, I know the portion in this case is 17 cents, but it also sets me up for inventory. I know that a batch is a quart camware round. So when I inventory, I can inventory the camware round. I've got one and a half. I know that each one of those is worth $3.41. I know in the, on the line, I have it by the ninth pan, and I can count those by one, two, three and a half ninth pans, and I know each one is worth $1.70, but when I use it in a recipe, it's 17 cents. So not only does it make the ingredient so that I have accurate recipe cards when I use it by the single ounce, but when I have inventories, they're accurate and fast because I count the product the way I see it, the way it lives on the shelves. You cannot have accurate inventories without recipe costing cards because otherwise everything's in transit, which means as soon as I take, I take a tenderloin and I make fillets, hundreds of dollars is now think it's been used because we no longer count it, it's in transit. That's a bullshit old way to do things because we're lazy. Well, I'm gonna tell you right now, by setting up a, an inventory, I'll show you in a moment, you can do inventory in under an hour every single week. Honestly, and you can hold people accountable to it. What else can I do with recipe costing cards? Well, I'm gonna go to something called Menu Profit Generator, where we take your recipe costing cards, 
your menu mix, your P mix, your item by item sales mix report, your velocity report, meaning what you sell in your POS system, what your customers actually purchase, what you recipe cards say they cost, and by putting all this together, we've got something called ideal mix or ideal food cost, theoretical food cost. And when I look at this, you're gonna notice my breakfast here, my breakfast special, I've got the recipe cost from the recipe costing card. We go to five decimals for accuracy. What we sell it for before discounts, how many we sold. Ultimately, it tells me what my food cost is, how much money I should have made on each line item, but more importantly, based on menu mix, that this item, my specials, runs a 17% food cost. As I come down and I go to my burgers and sandwiches, and I've got all these things here, a 26%. Ultimately, what I want to do is get all the way to the bottom of this, and I notice all the way at the bottom, based on what my customers actually purchase, because I have recipe cards, I can tell you that my ideal food cost in this restaurant is a 21.09% food cost. How does that benefit you? Well, when you do your food cost, ideal, uh, you can compare to I ideal. So it's beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending gives me use. Use divided by sales gives me food cost percentage. That's what actually left the shelves. We're going to go over inventories in a second. Cost gets sold in a second. But guess what? Let's say I ran a 25% food cost, but my ideal is 21%. I got a problem. We've got theft, waste, spoilage. We've got people not following recipe cards. I need to fix it. Now, before you go nuts, my expectation is my kitchen manager or chef will run an, an actual food cost that is one and a half to two points higher than ideal. We're going to make mistakes. We're not machines. But anything above that, I'm pissed off. We've got to fix it. But I can't get you here unless they have recipe cost cards, then by changing, using this file and changing prices, changing uh, quantities, changing uh, recipe costs, changing the mix, doing all these things, I can re-engineer a menu and the first time through, reduce your food costs three to seven points. I can't do that without recipe cards. Wanna know why systems are so important, why recipe cards and how they help you lead your team? I hope that's, uh, that's enough to, to spur you on. Now let's go to the second section that's called inventories. Let's stay in the food section here, and let me go to my inventories. Couple things. We talked about batch recipes to start. Now I'm gonna have you do weekly inventories. That way we know a weekly cost of goods sold. First thing, I'm gonna go to my line cooler. I'm gonna scroll down a little bit, and I wanna show you coleslaw is a recipe. It's a batch. I want it inventoried by 40 ounces. So whatever camware it's in, it's a 40 ounce. Well, I go down here, and my hash browns is 40 pounds. But I can also inventory this, notice I'm gonna change this, to the storage unit, which is a five pound unit. Or I can, I'm gonna switch again, I went inventory by the portion, by the one usable ounce. I cannot do this and know that the value is accurate the way I'm counting it if I don't have recipe costing cards. I also have the ability to go into any of my sections and have shelf to sheet inventory. I can drag and drop this item, four down, I can use numbering system, whatever it is. Now it's in the fourth position. So now I set up inventories where people count the product in the order it appears on the shelf they want it, the way you want it counted. By the 30 pound case, the five pound bag, by the uh, usable ounce or by five ounce portion bags based on a batch recipe. Then I simply count the quantity based on the way I want it counted and I have extensions. I have $5 million restaurants to do inventory in under an hour every single week. Now with that said, I come down to the bottom all right, let me save this change here. I come all the way to the bottom, and I not only know how much food is on each shelf, so I see where I, I should be locking things down, but I know how much food was on the shelf. This allows me, if I put my invoices in on a daily basis, I put in my sales, all I do is grab that information, I'm gonna go to my prime cost tab, cost of goods sold, and now when I'm working with my managers, I pick any two inventories, in this case the 25th through the second, one week, and bang, I know what my cost of goods sold is by category, done, right? Now I've got the numbers to communicate with my team based on my budget, based on where we are, where are we, what do we need to change? Are we doing a good job? Are we doing a bad job? I've got to have inventories. Inventories also help me set up par levels. They help me uh, set up my prep system. They help me go one step further. Remember the ideal food cost on the menu profit generator? If I've got all my other systems in place, if you will, for purchasing, 
I'm going to go back to food systems, go to my usage report. My usage report takes those inventory and my purchases, so beginning inventory, ending inventory, and all the purchases in between. And what it's going to do in a moment, just a couple clicks away, it's going to tell me, let me make this just slightly smaller so you can see, that I used two, in this case, two cases of burgers, two cases of uh, artichokes, whatever it may be. So now, based on my menu mix and recipe cards, I know how much product I should have used. I knew what I actually used by line item product, and I can see what we're over-portioning french fries. You want to see how systems help you lead your team versus why should food cost high? I don't know. With the right systems in place, when we talk about inventories, inventories translate from ideal food cost to actual, but line by line. How much did I use of each product? That's huge. What else? Tracking and controlling is very important. Let me make that larger. I'm going to go to a couple things. One, tracking and controlling. What are we going to do? We're going to track. We're going to use a waste sheet. What is a waste sheet? And actually, I'm going to uh, go back a little bit. This is my demo system, so we have, we have only a few things in here. I'm going to double click on here. And a waste sheet is simply every item, product that you have, if it's been wasted, stolen, spoiled. Then you can tally it up and know why. And you have any number of items. I don't care if you drop an all-American burger, a case of chicken goes bad. What this allows me to do is when I have my actual and ideal food cost and I'm uh, $500 off, I should see as much as $500 in waste as close as possible because on a daily basis, proactively, your managers can tell you what they did to fix it, that we don't make the same dumbass mistake tomorrow. It's a clipboard system. Key item report. Well, actually, I'm going to go down to my beverage systems where I have a key item report. It's your top 10, 15 items, those things that you want to pay attention to. Make sure they're not stolen. In this case, I want to use the bar as an example because I might do this with bottled beer to make sure I don't lose product. Let me make this a little smaller here. Oops. So it all fits on the screen. It's how many bottles I had on, on hand in the beginning. It's I brought out 12. It's how many I sold. I can see I'm missing 12 bottles. That'd be a major problem on a shift by shift or daily basis. I can prevent theft because I can, I can make sure people understand that what I inspect, I expect. And I prevent theft because we're paying attention. That's huge. What else does it allow me to do? If I've got recipe cards, I've got inventory systems, key item reports, way sheets, I've got standards to train. See, it's not just follow that guy. It's here's my system, my process, my way. And if your chef or kitchen manager, your bar manager, your general manager moves on for bad reasons or good, they've got a career choice change. They're going to open their own restaurant. You love them to death. As long as they've left you in better position by trained managers following systems, no matter who leaves, guess what? Your system, your process, your way is still in place. You can inspect them, communicate, lead your teams. Systems are critical. Here, again, part of prime cost, that's the cost of goods sold side. What about labor systems? Labor, extremely critical. Let me ask you a question. Everybody who's in the chat function, if you're coming in late, make sure you're logged into your YouTube account or your Google account, and you can use the YouTube live chat. Do me a favor. Tell me what your number one expense in your restaurant is. Type it in there. What do you think the number one expense? I'm going to give you a second to do so. What's the number one expense? What costs you the most money in your business? You type in it? I'm going to guess the vast majority right now, if I could see it, and I've got my team is going to be looking at, at those things right now, most of you have typed in labor. Wrong. It's an empty chair. You spend, you're spending all this money on labor, food, booze, electricity, the smallwares, the flatware, everything, linens to run your business. And an empty chair without a wallet and a butt sitting in there, it's costing you money. The second biggest expense is your labor cost. So how do we control that? Well, first thing we want to do is we want to make sure we have scheduling systems. And a part of that starts with what I call a master schedule. A master schedule is simply a cheat sheet for writing next week's schedule. So I'm going to go into my line cooks. And here's what people can and cannot work. How many shifts they wish to work. And heck, I can drop in those little nuggets of knowledge don't schedule till 10 a.m. has an 8 a.m. class. This way, anyone can write a schedule. It shouldn't be that one person, the only person in your, only one person 
can write schedules in your business. Anybody should write, be able to write a schedule because I've got all the information there, including my staffing guide, how many I, cooks I need in the AM and the PM. Then we go in we start writing our schedules. Well, you can write your schedules any way you want through templates, whether it's following uh, what you did last week. I don't care how you get there, but ultimately, if I'm looking to write next week's schedule, I need to have everybody in here, in and out times, what they can and cannot work, have everything in here the way I need to run my business. But where most people screw it up is we just schedule like we always do. How about budget? Remember, we talked about the pencil pusher as the budget side needs to push that along to social worker who not only want the greatest service possible, great hospitality, I want coverage, ah, I gotta make money too. So now we add something called the labor allotment. What the labor allotment is, is a system that makes me make sure that I, I schedule on budget. We've got a system similar called the purchase allotment for, for purchasing. I didn't go through, but ultimately all this does is take my last week information, type in my budget, hit calculate, and I tell my managers how many hours and how many dollars they have to spend next week. So I wrote my schedule like I always do. Now I have a budget based on my sales, based on my, my prime cost targets, and I go to the most important piece of this, and that's called the budget variance report. So if I'm writing my schedule for last week, this is the payoff. Otherwise, online scheduling is happy horse shit. Big deal. It's not on a spreadsheet. It's in software. No, right here. Because what I see here is I, my dishwashers, I'm four hours over budget. My bartenders are 15 hours over budget. And as I come down to the bottom, I'm ultimately 12 hours over budget. And as a manager, my job, depending on what positions I have, is to edit my schedule, get it to zero. That way we look at budget. We schedule for the needs of the business. How we get there is something called reverse labor system, in and out times, I'm not gonna go through right now, but you get the gist. With systems, I'm able to give up scheduling without giving up my checkbook. I have staffing guides, I know what people can and cannot work, who my good people are, I know what needs of the business are, but I also know what the sales are, and that I can't use the same hours I used last week because we're going into our summer season and in, in my, my town, summers are slow. In another place, if I use last week and summers are in season, if I use last week hours, I'd have my ass handed to me because my sales double or triple. So this ensures that your managers use every hour that they've been allocated. Now, I don't care how you use them, where you use them, but really, really important to schedule within budget. What about tracking? That which we measure improves. I'm gonna go into something called reverse labor system. And on a daily basis, I can look at a couple things. So I'm gonna go into this week uh, in our demo system. I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna look at a couple things. I'm gonna see where my labor cost is on a daily basis. Right now, 18%, or in this case, 18.99% was my number. Let me open that up so it's all in the same line. That's where I was. I budgeted an 18.79, but to be, to be on budget for the week is a 19%. All I care is if I use the hours allocated, as long as I get to the end of the week on budget, that's all I care about. So I can have a higher labor cost on a Monday, which gives me a different target by day of the week. So when you're communicating with your managers, you approve the schedule to run a higher labor cost. It's okay. Because on a Friday, I may run a much lower labor cost, whatever it may be. But also by tracking, I can see things with my naked eye that I wouldn't see otherwise. Notice here on this Tuesday, I highlighted originally scheduled hours, 158 hours. We actually worked 160 hours. What does that mean? It means that I worked two hours more than I had normally scheduled. I forecasted sales at $6,600, but I actually did $6,500 lower in sales. How did I work two more hours than I scheduled? See, sometimes you're going to see that's going to be 170 hours, that you've got your kitchen team having shift beers sitting on upside down pickle buckets, having their, right in the kitchen on the clock. This is huge. That which we measure improves. What about efficiencies? Well, if I get you a schedule on budget, but who says I'm, we're using the hours in the right place, I want to get to something called dollars per labor hour worked. So I'm going to look at next week's schedule. I'm going to look at my back of house alone. Dish, prep, line cooks. I'm gonna measure them against food sales. This is their efficiencies, how many man hours against sales. Without going through all the arithmetic, 
I need to do in the bottom right hand side $63 per man hour worked in sales to be on budget. And look, I'm hitting budget. But I'm gonna see things like inefficiencies. Why do I run a $57 per labor hour on Monday? Is it prep? Do I really need an extra, uh, an extra uh, 10 hours, if you will, to do $1,000 more in sales, whatever it may be. I can see where I'm using my money and is it efficient. Huge. Where we take our systems to communicate not just our gut when to cut, who to schedule, when to beef up or not. Here's our efficiencies. Absolutely amazing. Can make huge change. And then what do we do? We train these systems that anybody can schedule, anybody can control labor. It's based on a system, a process away, not a person. Now, what else? We've got other things. We've got things like checklists. Checklists are so important. They allow us to impose our will without being there. So here's an example checklist, not as detailed as I like, but am. I need opening and closing checklists for every position. That way every manager checks people out and we make sure that when we get to the bottom of this, we know the standard, but employee initials, manager's initials, I want them by paper every single day because this can change. This allows consistency. You allow to impose your will without being there. What are your cleanliness standards? What are your stocking standards? Instead of walking into your business and getting pissed off that people are idiots. Well, what about if we look at this and we say our cash controls? Well, I'm going to go back to our systems here. I'm going to go to Smart Systems Pro. I'm going to go to my daily paperwork, my end of day reporting. And this is simple. You probably have a spreadsheet for this now called your DSR, daily sales report, your end of night, your nightly numbers. I'm just going to type in what my food sales were. I'm going to arrow key down, put in my NABEV and so on. How the money came in. That I can ultimately see what my overshort is. I want to make sure every penny makes it into the bank account. I need to trust people with my money so I trust and verify. I've got to have these systems in place. Why? Because with cash controls, I can track my food costs, my poor costs, my labor costs. Put your numbers in once, tie everything together, know where your numbers are supposed to be. What else do I need to do? I need training systems. And training systems are so, so important. I'm gonna come in here, I'm gonna grab, here's a, an example of our server training program. In the PowerPoint window, you're gonna see we have job descriptions. So I'm gonna go here to page 46. This is an 86 page, or 87 page trainer manual. Uh, for just my servers. It's a six day training program. I'm gonna go to line here 46. Here's a job description. What the job is, how to do it, how well it should be done by when. For instance, maintains a positive attendance record by reporting to work for assigned shifts. 10 minutes prior to scheduled time, switching and finding replacements for no more than 5% of scheduled shifts, following company time off and illness procedures, having a 0% no call, no show record. You're that detailed, right? We need to have all this together. Then we need to have tests. If I don't pass day one test, I don't get to do a day two. If I don't pass day two, I don't get to go day three. This way we avoid having people who are not trained to be on our floor. Because it takes that one person to make that shitty Yelp review. Oh, I don't know. One of my good friends, elite members, used to be on my team here as a coach and, and, and a, a solutions coach. Nick Saldi and I, we went out, we did a seminar at his place, went out to dinner, and the server announces, oh, this is my first day, uh, all by myself, a day early, and she sucked. We, if I lived there, I wouldn't go back to that restaurant because of it. You need to make sure you've got trained people, so when you hit the floor running, they're great. We need to add, if you look at the PowerPoint window, evaluations based on what I hired you. This same bullet exceeds, does, uh, exceeds meets, does not meet and I need a trainer's guide. I ultimately need to know what, tell people how, what the standards are I want them to train to. Huge, really, really important. I need organizational charts. Well, what's an org chart? Well, you think it's just for big companies, but it's not, it's for you. I need to have everybody on my team create every position, what I want those positions to do, what the responsibilities are, and assign people's names. You'll notice in either example, I may have an owner that wears three hats. Another owner wears two hats. That way we know who's responsible for what, but especially for our managers. Who do I go to? What are they responsible for? Huge. We've got to do the same things the big companies do. Core values. Not going to spend a lot of time on core values, but they're extremely important. Why? 
Core values are who you are as a person. They almost never change. And I want to document your core values or your shared core values as a management team so managers make decisions based off your core values, not their own. In this case, we're going to sit there. I could document it. It could be as simple as in the PowerPoint window, just a core value on excellence. Well, or I have five words, or I've got 10 words, I've got a sentence, in this case, family, integrity, teamwork, training, hospitality, that if I make a decision based on your core values as an owner, I'm a manager, I'll never be in trouble. We need these systems in place to operate without chaos in our business. But ultimately, what we need to get to is a budget variance report. When we tie all of these systems together, I go to my prime cost, I go to budget variance, this is why I need all the systems in place. Here's the big payoff. Right here, right now. Why do I have all these systems? Oh my gosh, David, what you're describing is freaking work. Didn't I tell you it was? I suck. I create work. But the results are huge. Let me make this a little larger so everybody can see it. I know what my projected sales were. I know what my actual sales were. And I know that my sales were $800 lower this week than I anticipated. I know based on my cost of goods sold target and the sales that actually came in, 22% budget times actual sales, $49,000 in food sales, I should have used $10,700 in product. Beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending gives me use, use, 10 grand. But I actually used $11,000. In this case, $300 over budget. As I scroll down, I look at each one of those categories, I'm $314 over budget for the week. Come down to my labor costs, do the same thing. I was supposed to run it, line cooks at 10.97%. I actually did a better job, great job. But my prep cooks were off the charts. I lost $297. I lost $192 in bartenders. What, I have training hours in there and I didn't cut other places? Well, by the time I get all the way to the bottom, I had a budget target prime cost for this demo restaurant of 51.49. I actually came in at 52%. Man, that's pretty good, right? I'm a point off, only a point. That's $575. And some of you are thinking, David, $575, I'd be thrilled to be only $575 off. Well, it's bullshit. There's 52 weeks in a year. That's $27,198. Who here on this call right now, if I could hand you 27 grand, would take it? Well, I got news for you. You're pissing it away week after week after week. And the problem is $500 isn't the problem. I see $1,000, $2,000, $3,000. I had a call with a member today that was over scheduling by over 130 man hours. I wonder why I'm not making money. I need systems in place. I need to make sure you're a leader. Remember the pencil pusher knows the numbers, but doesn't communicate. It forces you to communicate, train these systems, hold you accountable to these systems, communicate these systems, making you a head coach. The social worker wants to make the best service, the best food possible, but oh shit, I got to make money. Makes me focus on numbers and teach systems to achieve those numbers while I deliver the best service possible, the best product quality, creating great memories. You want to take your skill sets, enhance them, to become a leader in your business, it takes leadership and that means systems. Do you understand? This is huge. It allows me to control, look at my sales, my cost of goods sold, my prime cost, everything I want done in my business. Now, if you've got questions, do me a favor, type them in the question box and I'm gonna answer them in just one second. I've got about five minutes. I wanna share with you a little bit about what we do and I'm gonna answer your questions. But by now, you, you learned what your management style is, how to overcome your weaknesses, how to use systems to make more money, communicate what you want done, improve your business. This is huge. Let me make a quick change here. And I wanna change it to small, here we go. All right. Let's talk a little bit about what we do here at the restaurantexpert.com. I won't take five minutes of your time and then I'm gonna answer your questions. My team is answering, I've got questions in here already, ready to answer. If you've got them, type them in. I'm gonna answer them for you in just a second. But let's pull this all together. What do we do at the restaurantexpert.com? We're a restaurant training coaching company that's software as a service. We teach you 
how to use the systems. We teach you what the systems are. We coach you and help you be successful. But we have software that handles every aspect of your business, from a daily manager log to cash controls, online scheduling system with labor controls, complete food, beverage, merchandise, recipe cards, ordering, inventory, prep, care reports, waste sheets, all on the cloud. Put your numbers in once, tie all your systems together, hold management accountable, that I can have that weekly budget variance, and use my systems to lead my team. You get the software, but you also get unlimited training support Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Call how you'd like. If you notice throughout here, I've got a chat window that's been up. You can chat. You can email. You can call. We're here to help. We have weekly webinars, free software training, webinars on a weekly basis, or two-day trainings here at our office 10 times a year free of charge. You get access to me or one of my coaches. Help me write my budget re-engineer my menu, teach my manager how to do cost of goods sold, look at my numbers, coach me on my business. And hey man, all the best athletes, you've heard the story, Michael Jordan has a coach, Tiger Woods has a coach, why? Because they force us to do the things we don't want to do. They see the things we don't see. You want to change your, your life, change your business, allow us to help you coach. We'll coach you. Now, by the way, you get an hour of my time or one of my coaches every single month, but we're not attorneys, not accountants. We don't punch a clock. You need an extra question? Pick up the damn phone, man. If you become a pain in my ass, I'll let you know. Otherwise, we're here to help. What else do we have? We give you all the training systems. Everything I go through for whether full service, quick service restaurant, management training, employee handbooks, train the trainer, harassment prevention, it's all there. It's all digitally downloadable, included in your membership. $8,000 in product. You've got, what else? Workshops, seminars. We've got a three-day workshop. It's only $347, or $300, uh, yeah, $375 for you and a guest instead of $1,500. We've got four one-day seminars free of charge, you and a guest. Ten two-day software trainings free of charge for you and as many people you want to bring. We're here to teach. By the way, there's no sign-up fee. There's no setup fee. It is month to month. In other words, you could break up with you like we're dating in high school. David, it's me, it's not you. I don't give a shit. If you're not going to do the work, I don't want to be an expense. But I can change your life. My team can help you change your life. Our software, our solutions can change your life. Get your life back. Make more money. Have managers know their job. I know it. But yeah, I suck. I create work. But if you're not willing to do the work, just give me 30 days notice. You're out. But let me tell you. But wait, there's more. It's like selling gin, Ginsu knives. Forget about if you sign up today. I don't give a rat's ass. If you watch this webinar, you're part of it. Take your time, man. But I'm going to tell you, I can't do this forever. Help you be successful. If you sign up, say you were on this webinar, you do a demo with Greg, Greg Sauerbach on my team, and you say you want to sign up. I'm going to give you, I'm going to commit one of my coaches to you and your management team for weekly calls for six months. That's an $800 a month value. That's more than you would pay me in a year. Because why? I want you to be successful. We're going to spoon feed you everything you need to be done that in six months you have everything implemented. But you've got to lead the team. You've got to hold people accountable. You've got to utilize the systems and change, you, change what you do, your habits, to check on them. So if you want change, we can do that. What's the investment? $347 a month. No sign-up fee, no setup fee. It is month to month. All you've got to do to learn more is call Greg Sauerbach toll-free at 1-877-457-6278 at extension 106. You can email him at greg at therestaurantexpert.com. You can go to therestaurantexpert.com and sign up now or sign up for a free consult, a 15-minute call. Do know our process is this. You set up the call. We call you, whatever it may be. We set up a 15-minute call. Learn more about you and your business. Tell you what we do. At the end of the call, Greg's going to say, if we're not right for you, tell us, no, you're not interested. We're done. Unless you opt out on my email list, I will, <laughs> I will badge you for life. But otherwise, we're not calling you again. Or you say, hey, you're interested, and we're going to set up a demo for you and your team. Anybody wants to be a part of it, as long as they have internet access and the phone, we're going to share our screen. It takes about an hour and a half. Show you the software, tell you what we do. At the end of that call, you can say, Greg, this is not for me. We're done with you. You got more questions, we'll set up another call, or hell, sign us up. Bottom line is you're the only one who can decide if you're ready for this kind of change. If you're ready to use systems to change your life, make more money, have managers know their job, knowing full well there's work involved, but as soon as it's in place, it's done, it's easy. It's just maintaining it. It's unbelievable the changes it can make. So now, I'm going to answer your questions. I'm done with my portion. I'm going to answer your questions. If you've got any questions, type them in the chat window. And I'll answer them in a second. If you came in late and you can't type in the chat window, make sure you log in 
to your Google account or your Yahoo account, and that will allow that function to work for you. Also, before you go, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel so you can get updates for things like this. Let's see here. I've got a few questions here. Uh, Sweetwater Weddings, uh, how do you account for the months where food cost is high because there's a spike in food cost? Or when do you have a short in-season period and a big day weekend is a loss to weather or you'll never see that money again? All right, that's kind of a, a really big question. But let me be very clear. If your food costs are going up, meaning your recipe cards are now increasing because you're, you're uh, using your barbecue catering company and pork butts are through the roof, ribs are through the roof, briskets through the roof. Sound familiar to my barbecue people? Well, because you have your recipe cards and your menu mix, I can actually see the impact. My food cost went up by one point and I lost $1,000 in profitability. I still measure my kitchen. They should be a point and a half to two points off. But now I can change my prices, what I sell things for. Change my portion sizes. Buy smarter. Get a descending, do a descending case report and attack my top 10 items by like quality or better quality, a cheaper price. Put a prime vendor agreement in place. Reduce my food cost by two, three points by promising a vendor 90% of my purchasing. See. I'll know within a week or a month, depending on how often you want to do your, your ideal food cost mix, I'll know like that. I don't have to wait 16 days, 15 days in the next period when I get a P&L. Why is your food cost high? Well, um, costs are higher. You don't know. And you've made the same dumbass mistake for 45 days in a row when simply I could have used recipe cards, menu mix, known my food cost, see the impact, and make changes not to continue losing money week after week, month after month, year after year. Hopefully that answers your question. And a big weekend loss, your, if your, food, your sales are low in a big weekend, it just means you have moved more food on your shelves. Unless you bought so much that it's stolen waste and spoiled, it doesn't affect your food cost. Um, can you enter inventory more often and change it? We don't really keep inventory. We purchase based on events that are booked. Or should we have future purchases planned in advance? So. Let me answer that question for you two ways. I'm going to switch my screen here. And I'm going to go to this. Hold on one second. I'm going to get their main monitor. There we go. I'm going to go back into Smart Systems Pro. And I want to show you a system called the Purchase Allotment System. Based on your sales forecast, your target food cost, and your purchases, this system well, based on whenever you take your delivery to that next period, for most for a restaurant, not a caterer, we're going to order probably on average two days a week, fine dining, seven days a week sometimes. But in your case, you know when you're, you've got to order to, you simply come down here and say, I'm going to order on Monday for a Tuesday delivery, and I've got $9,000 that I can buy in product. By the way, it's based on my forecasted sales. And if I added parties, I simply add that the forecast, which allocates more money, my target cost of goods sold based on my budget and prime cost. What I have already purchased, bang, I can get there very, very simply. The other question is, can I take inventory more often? Hell yes, you can take inventory more often, as many times as you want. But you can only take it once a day, if that makes sense. I've got another question here. Any suggestions for a business with partners that are in different places in the matrix. Look, here's the deal, man. The beautiful part about systems, if I've got business partners, one's a pencil pusher and one's a social worker, fan flipping tastic, where we really derail is when both are each. One person focuses on the guest, one starts writing them about numbers, the other one says, forget about your freaking numbers. What about the guest? Well, guess what the systems do? Budgets and systems, they put them on the same page. We save marriages, we save partnerships, we save families because no longer is one person smarter than the other. It's follow the system, follow the budget. There's one way, one way to do things, not one person or the other. Uh, Carissa asked me, uh, what's the best way to go about pricing in the software to keep our costing cards accurate? How often should, you, uh, th should this be done to ensure accuracy? You ready? I'm going to show you the answer to this, man. I'm going to go into my system. Let me, let me open up here. Go to food systems. I'm going to go to my import. I'm going to come down here to my order import. Take my 
Cisco, actually my Cisco here. I find a file, my Cisco order, I select the file, and when I click import, guess what? Every recipe costing card is now up to date. The next order is up to date, your next inventory is up to date. So I'm going to tell you right now, when I go through this process and I create this order, or whatever it may be, I'm going to have accuracy to the penny based on FIFO, my first in, first out, my most recent order, it's all done. So every order that comes in, you're going to make sure these prices are right. I've got one more question here. If you've got a question, make sure you type it in because I've only got one more in my, in my, in my chat window here. So I'm going to finish up after this unless I see one come in pretty quick. All right. Again, Catering Company says, how do you account for that when you sell events nine months ahead and the prices were different then? All right. So I don't know if I've got an example in my system, but I'm going to show you real quick here. And I don't know if I do catering, catering, yep, test party. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Using recipe costing cards and your menu profit generator meant for ideal food costs, not for what I'm about to show you. I have the ability to build parties. I know, all I care about, I can put in uh, rentals and all these other things. Right now, in this example, I just want to show you food. I know what the cost is. I know what the price is. I know what my target food cost is going to be. I know what, how much I'm going to make. Well, if you know, if you've got history of this, and you see that your prices, I'm sorry, your, let's go backwards, your costs have been going up 5% annually, I can simply adjust this to, let's call it $11.25. I don't know that that's the right percentage. And I could decide that I need to charge $50. I can change that recipe, in essence, anticipate what it's going to be, and gross it up. That's one option to make sure my profitability is intact. My second is simply look at it and say, I know that I'm going to give up profitability, so I need to book the party at a a 20% cost of goods sold in 20, instead of 21%. Now, I'm going to throw that all out the window and tell you if I'm making money on rentals, I'm making money on, on staffing, I'm making money on ice and paper supplies and all this stuff, and my food cost goes up to 30%, but I still make enough money, that's what I care about. So do know there's two different ways to approach it. It really just pick one way and stick with it. If you need help, I'd be happy to help you with that. I've got no more questions, so I'm going to switch my screen real quick. Hold on one second. I'm going to get there. I swear to goodness. Here we go. I want to thank everybody for be, being on today's webinar. I hope you've learned a lot. I hope you, you'll subscribe now on my YouTube channel and join me on, on webinars or YouTube live events just like this. Make sure you subscribe to my channel so you can see that I have my weekly YouTube tips. Go on there, see. Know that we're here to help. If you're interested in learning more, do me a favor. Call 1-877-457-6278. Dial extension 106. Talk with Greg Sauerbach. Email him at greg, G-R-E-G-G, -G, at therestaurantexpert.com. Or, you know what? Go online, learn. We won't badger you. We're here to help. We're either right for you or we're not. Because we suck, we create work. But we'll make you a lot more money. We'll put management in place, knows their job, knows what to do, how well to do it, by when. And we will get you to... Get your life back, man. I hope you've learned a lot. Appreciate being on today's webinar. We hope to work with you and talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody.